post-World War II when the Iron Curtain fell over Eastern Europe, the world got divided into a communist bloc and a democratic bloc. Some countries like Korea ended up being at the receiving end of this division, whereas some like Taiwan ended up staying intact because of the rivalry between the two blocks. Welcome to the Why in History. I am Ajay Kaul and today we are talking about the small island nation of Taiwan and its unique and checkered relationship with China. The most ironical thing about the history of Taiwan is that from the 17th century onwards, a significant number of migrants started arriving from China, often fleeing turmoil or hardship. And over a period of time, through the course of wars and treaties, Taiwan almost became a melting pot of several cultures within East Asia, but more importantly, a beacon of modernization within that region with respect to science and technology, economics and business, and society itself. The modern history of Taiwan, though, starts in 1894, when China and Japan went to war over their conflicting interests in Korea. Japan won the conflict, and the Treaty of Shimonoseki was signed in 1895 that ended the war. This treaty contained a provision that ceded Taiwan and the Penghu Islands to Japan in perpetuity. Western powers regarded this treaty as legally binding, but China did not consider it legally binding, seeing it more as an agreement imposed on it under duress. When the news of the agreement reached Taiwan, local leaders in Taiwan proclaimed the Republic of Taiwan. Asia's first republic. But its life was brief, lasting only about 10 days. Taiwan had no central government and it was plagued by warlordism. So the residents felt that the Japanese rule would be an improvement. And Japan itself was determined to make Taiwan a colony, so it dealt firmly with opposing movements on the island. Taiwan was Tokyo's first attempt at colonialism, and it ended up being a great success. Japan's military first governed the island, but within three years, um, those forces were no longer necessary. Japan ended up eradicating disease, establishing order, building infrastructure, and creating a modern economy in Taiwan. And very soon, Taiwan became the most advanced place in East Asia outside of Japan itself. When it came to Taiwan, Japan's policy makers focused on agriculture first and improved rice production with new seeds and farming techniques. Rice and sugar were exported. Taiwan, which had about 30 miles of railroads when Japan took control of the island, within a decade had increased the track length to about 300 miles and a lot more construction was planned. Taiwan soon became electrified as well, which facilitated the growth of new industries such as textiles and chemicals. And World War I ended up being a boon for the Taiwan economy as new industries were developed and trade expanded. At the same time though, Japan ruled Taiwan very strictly, using harsh punishment to enforce the law. Initially, Tokyo was not very interested in making Taiwan a democracy. And when it came to governing Taiwan, Japan wasn't sure whether it wanted Taiwan to be administrated separately or assimilated within Japan. Ultimately, Tokyo resisted assimilating Taiwan, though it did force the population to learn Japanese and absorb Japanese culture. That benefited the people of Taiwan to some extent 
as it gained them access to science and technology. But at the same time, it came at the cost of suppressing local culture and the Chinese language. In 1937, after Japan invaded China and touched off the Second Sino-Japanese War, Taiwanese were given the option of moving back to China, but very few did. In the period before the war in the Pacific widened to include the United States and its allies in 1941, Japan came to regard Taiwan as an important military base for its operations. Japan established military bases in Taiwan and used them as staging areas for invasions of the Philippines and other areas of the South. The Taiwanese worked in Japan's defense and war-related industries in Taiwan. So in other words, they abetted Japan's war efforts. Many Taiwanese actually served in the Japanese military, including units that fought in China. Taiwanese troops even participated in the atrocities against Chinese civilians at Nanking. And just as in any combat, Of the Taiwanese who served in the Japanese military, more than 30,000 were killed. So from 1895 through World War II, it is very clear that Taiwan is pretty well aligned with Japan and has less and less to do with China. And even China had started recognizing Taiwan as a separate entity. In fact, at its sixth Congress in 1928, the Chinese Communist Party recognized the Taiwanese as a separate nationality. But China was supporting the Allies during World War II, and after the first Cairo Conference of 1943, the United States and Britain agreed with Chinese leader Chiang Kai-shek that Taiwan was territory that Japan had taken from China so it would be returned to China after the war. And this decision was confirmed at the Potsdam Conference, which was held between July and August of 1945. And subsequently, after the Japanese surrender in 1945, the US forces handed over the control of the island to Chiang Kai-shek. Now the Taiwanese welcomed this decision mainly because they saw an end to the Japanese rule, but they were also apprehensive at the same time. Apprehensive because the communist forces of Mao Zedong were at war with Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist armies in China. So on October 25th, 1945, while the battle between Chiang and Mao's forces was still on, Taiwan became part of the Republic of China. But Taiwan was not made a standard province of China at that time. Chiang Kai-shek appointed Chen Yi, governor general of the island, with powers almost similar to those that had been exercised by the Japanese military governors. Now, Chen and several other leaders in China regarded Taiwanese as traitors, tainted by the inferior Japanese culture. He believed that the Taiwanese needed to learn Mandarin and he also took a few Taiwanese into his government. And the Taiwanese did not have much respect for the Chinese either. They felt that the Chinese administrators were technologically backward and dishonest. The Taiwanese found that the Chinese did not have a very solid system to run public services and there were also major gaps in the new legal system. Gradually, the economy started deteriorating and a few eradicated diseases started coming back. The education standards fell and the citizens in general felt ill-treated by the Chinese government. And things came to a head in February of 1947 when an incident triggered widespread civil disobedience. Ultimately, Chiang had to send troops to Taiwan to end the chaos, but several thousands were killed by the time uh, order was restored. 
Chen was subsequently relieved of his post and several local Taiwanese were appointed to political jobs. This helped alleviate a little bit of the tension, but considerable damage had already been done and the hostile feelings against mainland China continued. And in late 1949, Mao Zedong's communist armies defeated Chiang Kai-shek's forces in mainland China and Chiang and his government did exactly what several other ordinary citizens had done in the past. They fled and escaped to Taiwan. There was an influx of about 1.5 million people fleeing mainland China into Taiwan, creating more ethnic tensions and straining the economy even further. Chiang Kai-shek set up his government and promised to root out corruption. The United States abandoned Chiang Kai-shek at the time and it seemed very inevitable that the communist forces from mainland China would very soon invade Taiwan and bring the island under its control. But around that time, a significant international event happened which made the U.S. change its policy on Taiwan. The event was the Korean War of June 1950. And all of a sudden, the United States became very cognizant of the spread of communism in that region. And immediately, President Harry Truman sent the U.S. 7th Fleet in the Taiwan Strait to prevent any invasion of the island by the communist army from mainland China. With the support from the United States, Chiang Kai-shek was slowly able to get the Taiwan economy back on track. And he hoped to retake uh, mainland China at some point in time. And as the economy took off, Chiang Kai-shek was gradually able to win the political allegiance of the local population as well. In the mid-1960s, Taiwan's economy grew rapidly and Taiwan came to be known as an economic miracle. In contrast, mainland China languished economically under Mao because of the ill-advised programs like the Great Leap Forward in 1958-60. through And with a booming middle class, Taiwan had no reason to be envious of mainland China. In 1954, the United States and Taiwan concluded a mutual defense treaty under which the United States offered Taiwan military protection, but in exchange, it sought to constrain Taiwan from starting a war with mainland China. So far, it was Taiwan that had a seat in the United Nations, whereas mainland China did not. But in 1971, As the United States started courting China, Beijing replaced Taipei in the UN and that prompted other countries to seek more formal relations with Beijing and as a result, Taiwan became diplomatically isolated. Chiang Kai-shek died in April of 1975 and within a year, Mao Zedong also died in China. So the hope was that with the uh, demise of these two rivals, there would be more peace in the island of Taiwan. Three years after the death of Chiang Kai-shek, his eldest son, Chiang Jing-kyo, or CCK, was elected president. And around that time, in December of 1978, US President Jimmy Carter announced that the U.S. would end its formal diplomatic ties with Taiwan and normalize relations with mainland China. CCK, though, stayed unfazed and pursued the democratization of Taiwan. In 1980, the first competitive national election was held and in 1983, the first real opposition party, the Democratic Progressive Party, was formed. And in 1986, Taiwan had the first ever two-party election. In 1987, 
the ban on travel to mainland China was removed. And that led to a lot of personal and economic contacts across the Taiwan Strait. A first since 1949. And relations with Beijing did improve to the extent that Deng Xiaoping offered to resolve the dispute with Taiwan by following a one country, two systems approach, something similar to what was being devised for the return of Hong Kong to China. One country, two systems, meaning Taiwan could have its own local government under the mainland Chinese leadership. CCK promptly rejected that offer and continued on its effort to make Taiwan more self-reliant and independent. CCK died in January of 1988 before the end of his second term. He's often considered Taiwan's best president, mainly because he made Taiwan democratic and continued the trajectory of the economic miracle that his father had started. So how has Taiwan, with an area 0.3% of mainland China and population just 1.6% that of mainland China, survived its super aggressive neighbor? The answer is a mixture of military support and economic strength. As I indicated earlier, the 1950 Korean War prompted US President Harry Truman to extend military and economic aid to Taiwan so it did not get overrun by communist mainland China. Taiwan's economic miracle, though, was mainly run by the economic and technocratic team of Chiang Kai-shek, and it was executed in four stages that essentially entailed um, stage one, that was import substitution, followed by stage two, export-driven industrial development, stage three, the development of computer-centered high-tech industries, and stage four, the economic relations with and transfer of technology to mainland China. Now, during Chiang Kai-shek's time in Taiwan, China was reeling under the economic disaster of the Great Leap Forward, followed by the Cultural Revolution. So what was Chiang Kai-shek's driving force behind pushing for economic independence and growth? The answer lies in the colonization of Taiwan by Japan. Now, though both Japan and Great Britain were equally brutal towards the natives in the areas they had colonized, there was one stark difference with respect to economic policy followed by Japan versus the United Kingdom. Great Britain aimed at exploiting the resources of its colonies to benefit the home country. Japan, on the other hand, looked at its colonies as extensions of its economic empire, which means be it Korea or Taiwan, Japan was primarily focused building modern economies in these regions. So when Chiang Kai-shek took over the reins in Taiwan, the bar had already been set high by the Japanese imperialists. So he realized that if he were to build a connection with the local populace, he had to make the economy as close as possible as it was during the time of the Japanese imperialists. And the end result has been Taiwan is among the top 10 trading partners of China and is also home to TSMC, the world's biggest chip manufacturer. So why has there been a sudden escalation of tensions between China and Taiwan? Well, this starts in 2017 during mainland China's 19th Party Congress where President Xi Jinping set a deadline for reunification with Taiwan by 2049. That would be the 100-year anniversary of the 
communist rule in China. And many believe that just because he did set the deadline, she is most likely going to follow through on it. So why doesn't Taiwan become its own independent country and apply for membership as an independent UN member state? Well, Taiwan has met seven out of the eight essential qualifications for nationhood to be recognized by the United Nations as an independent member state, except one. And the requirement is that a country must be recognized by all five permanent members of the UN Security Council. And who are the five permanent members of the UN Security Council? United States, Russia, France, United Kingdom, and China. And no prizes for guessing who has been blocking the attempt by Taiwan to ascend to full membership status of the United Nations. And it is on that note that we end this section of the program. On to the quiz section. Question from the previous episode. Who was the first US president to visit India? Dwight Eisenhower visited India in 1959, becoming the first US president still in office to visit India. I say still in office because Ulysses S. Grant went on a three-year world tour starting May of 1877, during which he visited India, Europe, Africa, the Middle East and Asia. But all this happened after his presidency. So though Ulysses S. Grant was the first U.S. president to visit India, the first U.S. president still in office to visit India was Dwight Eisenhower. So the answer is B, Dwight Eisenhower in 1959. Question for the current episode. Currently, only 13 countries recognize Taiwan as a sovereign nation. Which was the last country to break ties with Taiwan? Was it A. Panama? B. El Salvador? C. South Africa? Or D. Nicaragua? Once again, which was the last country to end ties with Taiwan? A. Panama? B. El Salvador? C. South Africa? Or D. Nicaragua? The answer will be provided in the next episode. That's all we have in the current episode. We'll now take a break for Thanksgiving and the next episode will air on December the 10th. Being close to the holiday season, we'll cover the fascinating history of the two most popular beverages in the world, coffee and tea. We'll cover their history, their economic and social impact, and some interesting facts. Till then, stay safe, have a happy Thanksgiving, and keep looking for the why in history.